Good morning. Uh, my name is Elizabeth uh, Lutz. I'm the executive director for the Health Collaborative. And on behalf of all of the sponsors and panel, uh, excuse me, the, the planning committee, we'd like to thank you very much for spending the day with us today. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to um, say thank you, very special thank you to our, our sponsors and our planning committee. And on your um, information packets, you'll see a little piece of paper um, that's not enough to say thank you for all of the great work that everyone's doing and all of the, the, the support that's been provided for being able to put this summit on today. Um, so on your screen, you're also um, seeing some of the agencies uh, that were able to uh, place faith in this and actually bring uh, the opportunity to have uh, Dr. Holly and Dr. McCarthy um, here with us today. So again, I'd like to just say thank you to you for participating and being a part of the summit and thank you to our sponsors and our planning committee for helping uh, coordinate um, this event here today. I'd like to um, introduce uh, Ms. Aurora Sanchez, the Executive Director for Bear County Department of Community uh, Resources. Thank you, Liz. Appreciate it. Um, back in about 2008, uh, we got a mandate from a person you can never turn down, Judge Wolf. And he said, you know, we've got a Ryan White HIV program that uh, needs to be beefed up and fixed up and, and made best practices. And so we take everything he says very seriously. So with Charlene Doria Ortiz's leadership, we did just that. And this uh, meeting today and our sponsorship, uh, along with the Health Collaborative and others uh, for these informative and training sessions is a direct result of the mandate we got from uh, a man who is a politician, but a very nice man on top of that. Dr. Colley and I were talking outside and I said, uh, you know, he really does have a heart. You know, he's a politician, but he's a politician with a heart. And since 1971, he's been serving the public, uh, first as a state representative, and uh, then he went on to be the mayor of the city of San Antonio, and he's been the county judge. And he's been the moving force be behind a lot of uh, backdoor improvements in this community that have improved the general health of the community. But in particular, he's got a special place for, uh, for people who have chronic diseases and people whose uh, health status isn't always the best. Uh, so I'd like to introduce my boss, Judge Wolf. Oh, thanks, Aurora. And uh, thank all of you for the great work you're doing in our community. As you know, Bear County is responsible for a great <clears throat> part of the health care of this community with our, <clears throat> with our hospital system. Uh, Commissioner's Court voted in 2008 to put some almost a billion dollars with a B into doubling the size of our hospital out at the UT Health, Sci uh, UT, Health, UT Health Science Center area. Some two million square feet we'll have there and then the building that, that we built down downtown, so we, we've really encouraged our hospital district to kind of spread its wings to look more at prevention than just treatment of acute illnesses. And I think they're doing a good job of stepping up the pace, and I know they do that in our emergency center and our clinics, HIV testing, which certainly makes a, a great deal of sense. It's just still difficult. Well, doctor, glad to have you here this morning. <laughs> Uh, it's still difficult for me to believe that we're, that we're still talking about H -E HIV and AIDS. I think it was 1987 <clears throat> when I went on the city council and, uh, and it, would, you were, it was just becoming uh, apparent that there was a great disease that was spreading across the United States and a lot of us didn't understand it. We didn't understand how it would be transmitted. Uh, there was a great deal of fear during that period of time that uh, this thing could really get out of control. And slowly but surely, programs were developed and, and began to work on it. But here we are, what, 20, 20, 26 years later? And I think through history, you know, when you have a major outbreak of a new disease or something, usually it has a lifespan of about 25 years. And here we are today, still in a desperate fight against AIDS and HIV and the testing and the, how do we go about treating it. So it's not been a not been an easy task, and it's one, even today, that uh, we continue to kind of, at least in the public's mind, kind of push to the side. So I think this, uh, this initiative to uh, move forward and to try to get additional uh, uh, testing, uh, maybe not required, but certainly in physician's offices and doctor's offices, every time you go in for something, whether it's dental or whatever, 
if you can be tested for HIV, I think it's a very, very positive step. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Holly when he came in this morning. He got up at 3 o'clock this morning in Beaumont to drive all the way over here. That's a pretty good dedicated doctor, I would say. <laughs> and uh, we had a chance just to visit a, a little while and about what he's doing in, in his own uh, private practice in terms of HIV testing and the fact that it's not an inordinate amount of expense to be able to do it, five, ten dollars or so. So I think if we continue to uh, move forward on this, it's a step forward. But more, imp just as important in that, though, is that the healthcare collaborative and the work that's being done in terms of prevention, <clears throat> I think is extremely important. Uh, we started biometric testing uh, just this year. It's the first time that we've asked employees to, 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 to take a test to see if there's some problems they've got. Obviously, when you see it, you know you may have one, but you see it again. I always know I have high cholesterol, but when I got that biometric test again, I said, well, you know, I think I'll do something about it this year. <laughs> so I started taking a statin. So I think it's good that we're doing those sort of things, that we're encouraging uh, recreation, encouraging getting out, taking care of your body. Uh, County is putting in some 85 million at 85 different sport, uh, 13 different sports complex to encourage that. Uh, we're asking our uh, district to continue to move on the prevention programs, the, the uh, work that's been started on terms of diet and what you can eat and what is good for you. All, I, I just think that's extremely important. We were in the natural foods business for almost 30 years, I guess, and, uh, and so here I am, 73, and still in pretty good shape. I tell everybody if they'd uh, go to a natural foods place and eat right, they'll die of nothing. <laughs> well, it doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> but you do have an opportunity to live a little longer and, and to have a healthier life and a more productive uh, life by uh, taking care of your body, uh, by you know, restricting your extra, extracurricular activities to where you don't get in trouble by not drinking, not smoking. We all know those things. But I think the more we talk about them, uh, the better, better opportunities we have to get people to ascribe to that sort, that sort of life. So I, I just want to thank you in general for what you're doing, the private physicians that are here today. Dr. Chiscano, uh, I, don't know, I don't know where he gets all his energy from, but <laughs> he's involved in so many civic things in the community too. And, uh, 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 good food. Good food. <laughs> so he's been a great, great leader for our community and all of you that have participated in this and really appreciate the physicians that are in private practice that are willing to take time and effort to help us on these initiatives. Aurora Sanchez does a great job for the county, has worked very hard to try to outreach and to make sure that we're funding and trying to help various organizations as they fight some of the very difficult diseases we have in our community, and this is certainly one of them. So thank you, everything, for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge Wolf. Um, I'd like to um, welcome Isabel Clark, who is uh, our partner in this event here today, and she's got um, some information to share with everyone, and then we'll get started with some of our presentations. So. Do I need, okay, can you hear me? Awesome. Okay. Well, I want to welcome everyone for coming today. Um, we're really excited that you could actually take the time out. We know that the focus today was to invite healthcare professionals, people that provide the direct care, or you speak with those decision makers that can help support routine testing in your institution. So welcome. Um, today we're going to have uh, hopefully a good program. It's, it's mainly directed to people who are not so familiar, you don't know so much about routine HIV testing. Traditionally we've had 
um, risk-based testing, counseling and testing programs, um, mobile vans going out and taking rapid test kits out into the community, targeting people. Um, routine testing is basically trying to make everyone aware about HIV and the importance of knowing your status. So that's what we're going to be talking today is about testing as a routine preventive screen, a standard of care, and it's an opt-out. So we're not forcing it down anyone's throat, but we're trying to impress you on the importance of knowing your status. At that point, you're going to be educated. Um, you'll know more about the risk factors and hopefully prevent becoming infected down the road. Um, I wanted to just do a little bit of business inside your packets. We did have the disclosure to learners. So really, the activity, it received no commercial support. The speakers and planning committee had no financial interest. Um, the accredited status does not imply endorsement by DSHS, the Continuing Education Service, um, Texas Medical Association, or the American Nurse Credentialing Center, or any commercial products or services. And so full disclosure information is included in your materials, and that's just you know, to make sure we're offering continuing education credits today. So that's just part of the formal process of letting you know that no one has any interest. Or if they had, we would have taken care of that. So there would be no conflict. Next. Um, if you are requiring um, requesting continuing education, you need to make sure that if you didn't register online, that you have somehow done the formal registration to be here today, um, that you signed in the participant sign-in sheet. So we will need your email address, and we need, need it to be eligible, uh, eligible because the certificates will be emailed to you. Um, of course, participate, be here and listen. And then at the end, before you leave, you would need to complete the evaluation. It is also in your packet, and I think at the very back. So that would need to be turned in. And then we go back and tally them up and We'll send your certificates to you. Next. Um, once again, I want to thank our co-sponsors. Um, Department of State Health Services, we have funding from CDC and created the Test Texas HIV Coalition. Um, so a lot of our meetings we have, it's sponsored mainly through our Test Texas organization. But we're trying to bring in stakeholders, people who have an interest in providing routine testing or caring for people living with HIV. Um, our partners, University Health Systems and um, Central Med, they were um, our, well, actually, they're our partners here in San Antonio. So I would hope the people that are here from UHS and Central Med, if you could stand up, because we really want to acknowledge you as being the leaders in San Antonio, that you've been the early adopters. We've got. And also, um, one of the intentions is after we have this, depending on where you work, um, if you aren't doing routine testing, we want you to go back to your facility, speak with your leaders, your decision makers, and we're going to have a workshop, provide technical assistance to help you set up a program at your site so that you can offer routine testing. I'm going to talk a little bit about now, um, the grade A rating, so now you can bill for it, and pretty much you'll get reimbursed. So we do think now that things are moving in the direction that the barriers are becoming less and less. It's much easier to do routine testing. It's just we need to get people more comfortable with it. Um, our other partners, as um, Liz said, Bear County, the Ryan White programs have been, you know, I've been working with Charlene, I guess, now for two and a half, some, I don't know how, pretty long time, and have been talking about doing something like this. And the University of Texas Health Science Center, the South Texas Family Aid Center, they also were sponsors that contributed significantly. And then the Health Card Collaborative, they did so much of the organization for the community and um, brought us all here today. Next. So our purpose today is to increase awareness about HIV and how it's affecting um, San Antonio and Bear County. Dr. Mangala from Metro Health will be here right after me to talk about the, the data, the surveillance, um, what he's learned when he was working in Georgia at the state of Georgia and his work throughout the, I think he said he may have been in South Africa too, but so he's, he's been very much in the HIV AIDS world and can share a lot in addition to the, the data from San Antonio. Um, recognize the ethical issues related to routine HIV testing. Um, it is, um, and everyone is in a healthcare profession. They do have a code of ethics, and I think HIV AIDS is very much of the heart of that. It's even though there are some people can be uncomfortable going back into the late 70s, early 80s, people pretty much separated themselves. There's so much stigma, and we really need to bring it back into medicine as it is part of. I mean, HIV is a chronic disease, and medicine needs to take care of it. I mean, it's not just specific to one practice. Um, we're going to have lessons learned. Um, Dr. Holly is here from SETMA. He's going to share what he's doing in primary care. 
And then Dr. Jamie McCarthy from Houston Memorial Hermann, he'll be here after lunch to talk about implementing an emergency systems. And then we really want to encourage healthcare providers to implement integrated and sustainable routine testing. So that's why we're here today, to prevent you kind of the whole um, overview of routine testing, its importance, the implementation, different settings, and then how you can actually get started. So we did, we got started um, after the late 80s. Um, in 2006, the CDC guidelines, they released some revised recommendations. Um, they wanted to identify people earlier in the disease process. We have people who are diagnosed late in the process, so their, their lives are shortened. Um, targeted testing really isn't working. We still know that anywhere from 18 to 20 percent of the people in the U.S. are living with HIV and they don't know it. And this contributes to further transmission. Um, and in Texas, one in three re receive a late diagnosis. So either at the time they're tested, they are diagnosed with AIDS, or within the next year, they receive an AIDS diagnosis. So they are very much advanced in their disease. Um, the guidelines are for routine opt-out um, screening in healthcare settings. So it's not someone who knows what their behavior is, and they, they, in the back of their mind, they know, yes, I may have been infected, I may have HIV, and they go to a testing center. These are for people who just don't know or they don't have access to health care, and so there's no way for them to be tested. They're just not going to do it. So the recommendation is to test all persons between the ages of 13 and 64. Um, at least notify them they have the opportunity to opt out and say, no, I don't want to be tested. Um, if it's an at-risk population, the recommendations were to test annually. And then the other purpose really was to remove the barriers to testing because so many um, practitioners would say, well, I have to deal with a separate consent. That takes so much time. And then in some states still have a pretest counseling. So there's a pretty involved um, pretest counseling assessment that they would do before someone would get the test. And when you're in a doctor's office, if you have 15 minutes with a patient, that's a lot of time. If you're going to be required to do a, a prevention counseling workup before you even order a test, that's, out, that's just out of the question. With medicine today, you, you can't expect that in regular health care. The rationale is that we do. We know universal HIV screening programs work. We have a very safe um, blood system today, blood donor, blood donor system, and then the perinatal testing. We have very, very few um, mother-to-child transmissions. So that is mandated um, routine testing during pregnancy and have been able to identify um, mothers that are with, pregnant with, and they have HIV and they can be treated and most of the time those babies are born um, free of HIV. The demographics have changed. Um, basically, we have increased rates in the elderly. I've spoken with a couple of doctors that see patients in nursing homes, and they say, yes, we've started testing, and they've had some men in their 70s and 80s that they're just testing now for HIV and having to treat them. Um, women, ethnic minorities, non-urban, and the heterosexual population, so the ones that we, they don't have the traditional risk behaviors, they don't know what their past has been, what other risks they may have been exposed to. And then patients with HIV infection, we know through um, research that patients living with HIV, they do go to healthcare because of other reasons, but they're not offered the HIV test. And many times the complaints for the, the reason they're at the doctor's office could be related to their HIV disease. Well, why do people not get tested? And they're not coming knocking on the doors and setting up an appointment to, you know, have their annual check and get their HIV test, um, stigma. And stigma has been with us since the beginning of HIV AIDS. Um, and persons who've grown up in the time, you know, I think younger people are less um, aware of the stigma, but people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, it's, they, they remember the days when the fear of AIDS. And so if they think that if someone says, would you like an HIV test? And they go, well, yeah, they're worried that their provider will think, oh, well, they have a risky behavior. You know, they're doing IV drugs or they have multiple sex partners. Um, many don't believe they're at risk. So there's been studies where you've interviewed people who had been diagnosed with HIV. They give them a survey of the different risk behaviors. They may admit to participating in these behaviors, but then at the same time, they'll still respond, no, I'm not at risk. So I don't know how I got HIV. So there's a lot of denial going on. Um, and as I said earlier, Many people, we're dealing with folks who are in poverty, they don't have access to health care, um, or the doctor doesn't offer it, or the facility, and we know that they're seeking health care on average four times before they're tested. 
Um, the big one, too, is providers don't think their patients are at risk, and many have never been trained or just you know, maybe had one hour um, lecture on HIV AIDS, and so it's not familiar with them. And if you're not familiar with something, it is uncomfortable talking to people. So the role of awareness on HIV status is, it's huge. Um, as I said, about 18% of the people are unaware of their status. Once people become aware of, um, that they're HIV positive, they change their behaviors. And so they're less likely to transmit. And then if they're in care and on antiretroviral treatment, their viral load decreases, hopefully, to undetectable and anywhere from 90 to 96% um, decreased chances for transmission. So it is huge. So that also contributes to your community viral load. If you can get all your people who are living with HIV in care on treatment to undetectable viral loads, you can pretty much prevent more HIV and definitely we can prevent AIDS. The benefits of routine testing basically want to identify HIV early in the um, disease process. Um, when you dis detect someone early, they have a greater response to antiretroviral therapy, reduced viral load, lower transmission, lower health care cost, and improved quality of life. Those people are going to live longer and contribute to your community. So it's just a win-win. You know, you're not spending as much money on their care because they're not going to be sick, and they continue to work and contribute. So we're going to shift to um, our project in Texas um, after the CDC um, revise the guidelines. Of course, we all had to sit down and think about how are we going to react to this. So this is our response. Um, we have things going for us in Texas. Texas law supported the revised recommendations. We had to change nothing. I mean, we already had everything in place. Um, HIV consent can be included in your general consent. You don't require a separate document. Um, Pre-test and prevention counseling is not required. And then one of the things, too, our laws say that if someone is positive, you have to arrange access to care, prevention, and support services for those people living with HIV. So we already had everything established. We didn't have to do anything different. Um, the 81st legislature, I think that's four years ago, they, they mandated that DSHS spend $4.4 million to support routine testing in healthcare settings to, uh, according to the CDC guidelines. Um, we applied for a grant, we got funding, and in September 2008, we had our first partnerships with Harris County Sheriff's Department and continued to partner with them. And then we started with two hospitals in Dallas and Fort Worth, Parkland Hospital and John Peter Smith. And we do choose our partners that tend to serve um, their, their public hospitals or community health centers because we're trying to reach the, the people who don't have access, I mean, as much access. So that, that is where our dollars are going. Um, once again, I want to rec um, thank University Health Systems and Central Med because they are really leading the way here in San Antonio. I'll share just a little bit about them. But in July of 2010, we brought on University Health System. And then in July of 2011, a year later, we had Central Med. Um, University Health, they started testing in their express med clinics. Um, they have an emergency center which is staffed and run by the med medical school. They have a lot of physicians, you know, going in. They've got um, their interns. So there's a lot of change. So for them, it was much easier to start in the express med. It was a smaller setting. They had a little more control. But in October of 2011, they've been doing routine testing in the emergency center, had a lot of changes, we, we, nothing can be the same. There's always a new challenge around every corner you turn, but their um, testing numbers have increased significantly, I'd say in the last six to eight months, and they're doing a lot more testing in the emergency center. Their general consent, it's included in the general consent, I mean the HIV test, and then they have signage set up so that according to the 2006 CDC guidelines, all our patients are offered the HIV test, ask your provider if you have questions. And so that's the opportunity for them to provide the education and the importance of the routine testing. Um, they do the conventional blood draw and submit it to their lab, internal lab. And to date, they've identified 46 positive persons, um, 22 new, so people who did not know that they had HIV before this test, and then 24 um, previous. Their positivity rate is a 0.9 overall, and to be cost effective, um, the CDC, they've done all their, you know, crunched their numbers. To be 0.1, um, have a positivity rate, is cost effective. 
So they're nine times that. And when you look at the new positives, the previous, it's like 0.5. So they really, this is a very cost-effective program. And when you talk about, oh, well, you found some previous positives, what does that mean? Well, it's another chance to get someone back into care. And 88% of their patients that they've identified with HIV that they've tested are into care. So many times people may have been tested and never followed up with an appointment. They didn't, they said, I was feeling fine, I'm healthy, I don't need to go to the doctor. Or someone had a bad experience or they've moved and it's just an opportunity to get someone back into care. At Central Med, we partnered with them beginning in July of 2011 and they offer routine um, testing at a standard, as a standard of care in 12 of their clinics. So they're out in all of Bear County, I believe. Also, there's some, um, a couple of sites in the um, New Braunfels area. So they're kind of going a little bit beyond this community. Um, once again, their test, HIV test is in the general consent. They also do the conventional blood draw, but they send their tests out to LabCorp where they're processed. They have an established patient base. So if you're in primary care, you're not in the hospital setting, you know, you have established patients, basically you would have them come back for an appointment if they're positive and then discuss the importance of what the diagnosis means and get them into care. Um, they have, um, from the get-go, they've been billing and been reimbursed. They have a lot of their um, patient base, either they're in the title programs or Medicaid. And so half of all of the tests that they do are billed, so they're reimbursed, and we only pay for the half that don't have a payer. And then their outcomes, they uh, have identified 44 positive, 12 new, and 25 previous. There were seven that they didn't really know the history, and that happens a lot, and so it might be some that came from another state, and our, their data hasn't made it to ours, so we aren't able to get a clear picture. Um, their positive rate is 0.3. Um, which is very good. I mean, you would expect 0.1 or 0.2 for the little primary care settings in the small communities because you just have a much smaller population and it's not as random. Um, and their, their confirmed rate is 73%. And sometimes that the number is actually lower because somebody you confirmed to care may not have been reflected in the, the late, latest data that they submit to us. We have done, this is what we've done since the beginning of our project, and we include the numbers from the city of Houston. We partner with them quite a bit. Um, we're supporting the Memorial Hermann system, um, but we also work with Ben Taub, um, LBJ, and we share our data. So in the state of Texas, with the CDC funding between city of Houston and the DSHS program, we've done almost a million tests, 981,000, and we've identified over 10,000 positive persons living with HIV, and of that, almost 5,000 are new positives. Um, our overall positivity rate is 1.1, so that's 11 times over what would be recommended as cost effective, and the new positivity rate is 0.5. So we definitely know that our funding is going into the right places. We are testing in the right um, centers, and we're getting people identified and into care. So um, just what has happened since the CDC guidelines, we've made a lot of progress. Um, next slide. In 2010, um, we have never had a national strategy. We had these guidelines, the revised guidelines. Um, we've been funding projects all in all, all the different countries. In return, we demanded that they had a national strategy. If we're gonna send you funding, you have to have a strategy. So we now, in 2010, have our own strategy. and. The purpose really is to identify the undiagnosed cases, um, reduce the number of people who become infected, to increase access to care and improve health outcomes for people living with HIV. And that is huge. I mean, at the beginning, you know, it's like we want to do as many tests as possible, but if we're not getting those people into care, you know, the transmission of HIV continues. And then we want to reduce the HIV-related health disparities because we do know that there are populations that really have less access. They don't go in and, and have re regular me medical care. And so we're trying to reach those people and help them. In 2010, um, the CDC and the American Public Health Laboratory, they proposed a new testing algorithm. And why did they do that? Because we've been um, using the algorithm that was established in 1989. And what it said then is that the Public Health Service recommends that no positive test results be given to clients or patients until a screening test has been repeatedly reactive, 
on the same specimen, and then a supplemental, more specific test, such as the Western blot, which would be the confirmatory, um, you want to va validate. So you want to make sure the person is positive. Next slide. How are there limitations? Um, the Western blot today, we now know that we have a lot of tests that are much more sensitive. So the Western blot, if you have a preliminary positive, the Western blot can't even identify, confirm that positivity rate until weeks out for some of these tests. Um, we now have fourth generation um, technology where we can identify the P24 antigen. That's the, the protein that is the first thing that will show up in the blood um, before the antibody. So it will actually pick up that antigen and it'll pick up also HIV 1 and 2. And also we have a lot of cross-reactivity. More than 60% of persons with HIV 2 infection, they, they will be misclassified with HIV 1 through the Western blot. So clearly we need a new algorithm. And Jenny McFarlane, um, she's our team lead with, at the state. She's going to share a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, so in December 2012, um, although we had this proposed algorithm and some people had purchased the fourth generation testing, I think they were available at the end of 2010 and 2011, um, BioRad and Abbott have the, the platforms. Um, they were able to identify either the antigen or antibody. However, the multi-spot, you need to differentiate. And the packaging did not approve it to use as a confirmatory or a reflex um, differentiation test. But that happened in December 12, and so that was sort of the green light. And then we have the nucleic acid testing to either detect the RNA or the DNA of the very early virus. And so we can confirm acute cases um, as early as 11 days. I mean, you're not going to see it in the early first 10 days, but after that. So, and in the Western blot, it may take three months before it could even confirm. So. We, we are really making a lot of great strides. Um, and the other piece that has been so exciting on April 30th, um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, they released their new recommendation for HIV screening as a grade A. That is like the top grade. It's grade A, B, but A is the best. Um, and what the recommendation states is that clinicians should screen for HIV in adolescents and adults between the ages of 15 and 65. If, the young, if you have younger adolescents or older adults, if you know they're at increased risk, test them. Um, and then, as the CDC guidelines, all pregnant women, including those who, are, who present at labor, who are untested, or that you don't know their status. So this pretty much, um, I think, we've had so much resistance of who's going to pay for it. Now we can code for it. What this means, next slide, basically is that um, we know that the U let me back up. The grade A, that it's going to stay that way. There's high certainty. The evidence is so strong that it's very unlikely that any of the new research that comes after would change this. So they're going to continue to keep this as a grade A. Um, <laughs> screening intervals, this is always kind of, everyone wants to know, how, how often should I screen? Well, they've made an attempt. They, the little caveat that there's insufficient evidence to determine optimal time intervals. However, they recommend at least a one-time screen for everyone. Um, repeat screening for those known to be at risk for HIV infection. You have someone who's had multiple partners, um, men having sex with men or IV drug users. And then rescreen annually groups that are at very high risk and then depending upon, it's professional judgment, clinical judgment. You know what your, your population needs, but I think the least um, concern, like three, three to five years. Next. Um, what are the implications? We know that with this, it is going to take a lot more resources. If you're identifying people with HIV, of course, you're going to need to get them into care. So it's going to cost more money. But ultimately, we're going to save because if we're going to be able to get them treated and decrease transmission. Um, the federal rules require that private insurance and Medicare plans will pay for this. So there's coding and there will be no copay. So the, you don't have to worry about, I don't want to do a test that my patient didn't request and they can't pay for it. So we think this is a new day <laughs> and we're hoping that the people who hear this, our message over and over again will finally go, oh yeah, I think I can do that. Um, just ending with the American Medical Association ethics policy, they said, stated, and this was back when the 2006 guidelines came out, it's the physician's duty to promote patient welfare and to improve the public's health, and these are fostered by routinely testing their adult patients for HIV. So they recognized back in 2006 that, yes, it is your duty to identify any patient of yours that is living with HIV. 
And then the national strategy, the vision is we want the United States to become a place where new HIV infections are rare. And when they do occur, every person, regardless of age, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, or social economic circumstance, will have unfettered access to high quality, life extending care, free from stigma and discrimination. So we are hoping by just constantly talking about routine HIV testing that will become more normal. HIV is not this word that you whisper, it's, um, it's a chronic disease that can be treated. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny McFarland. Um, she has been with the Department of State Health Services for a long time, working in the field for about 20 years, and she has a lot of knowledge and she's gonna continue. Can you all hear me? Thank you. Good morning. Um, is there a pointer by chance? Laser okay. pointer? No. Okay, I'll use my finger. Or I, I, I'm, I'm a roamer when I talk. Um, but thank you all very much for including me in your agenda today. Um, I'm Jenny McFarlane. I'm with the Texas Department of State Health Services. And um, I have been working with HIV and AIDS for quite a while. Um, it's been over 26 years now. And I started in the day where we would work with patients and pretty much say to them, you know, okay, um, you're concerned about getting an HIV test. Let's get you tested. But you know what? We still don't know whether or not you were infected. And back in 1987 when I started doing this, you know, maybe six to nine months ago. But now, as Isabel said, we have the ability, due to the newest test technology, in order to determine whether or not someone is infected actually about 11 days after their infection. And what does all this mean? And why is it this Western blot is, you know, our hardcore workhorse test that we've used? Why are we looking at it differently now? Well, if we look at days before the Western blot turns positive, we, let's pretend we start at day zero. That's when the Western blot turns positive. But now let's look at other test technologies that have occurred. Well, the Vernostica test, some of you may remember this, this was the oral fluid test that's used with the Orsher test. Well, the folks that used to make Vernostica, which was actually the processing um, fluid used, um, stopped using it. Um, and it would detect infection actually after the Western blot. Now these are the rapid test kits that are available. Now many of you are familiar with these rapid test kits because if you've worked with an HIV counseling and testing program or an AIDS services organization, you know about the targeted testing which we do, which is very important and is a partner in routine testing. So when we look at the rapid test kits that are out there, we see that they will identify infection a little bit earlier before the Western blot. So if I use an oral fluid um, or a quick test, it actually, if you use oral fluid, it's right around here with the Vernostica. Now if I use blood, it's going to be right before the Western blot. So you say, okay, Jenny, well fine. We're using these tests. It's identifying infection. And then we use the Western blot. Well, the more sensitive test, like the INSTI, which will get you results in 60 seconds, it's the newest rapid test kit that's available, if it comes back reactive and then you run a Western blot, it is possible the Western blot will come back non-reactive or indeterminate. And then you have an acute infection. And this is where identifying, remember the national strategy and remember the goals, is to identify every HIV infection. If we look at these other rapid test kits, we see that they're close and they are good tests. These are, I'm not, we're not trying to disparage these tests at all, but we want to let make sure clinicians know the options. Can the next one, please? Now, multi-spot and reveal. Multi-spot is the differentiation test. You're thinking, what does that mean? It will determine whether or not you're looking at HIV-1 or HIV-2. And it is an important um, product that is now in the new algorithm. And then Abiac is actually the oral fluid test that is now used with the Western blot. 
And so when someone sends in their Orsher um, test, it, or excuse me, it is one of the options that is used. But again, we've got these concerns with using oral fluid testing where you don't have as much antibodies in your oral fluid. Again, if I have an established infection, it's going to show. Okay, next one. Now, these are your third generation tests. Advia, Vitros, GS1, um, that is the, the, the third generation. These tests are used in most of your laboratories in your large-scale testing centers. They are very effective tests, and, and they have been used. Now, again, I'm running a, a third-generation test. It's reactive. I send it for Western blot. And I'm also talking about the immunofluorescent assay test as well, the IFA, which is the other confirmatory test. You run it. Again, you could have a non-reactive or indeterminate. And then these are our new um, superstars. These are the fourth generation tests. These are large scale platforms. You can batch them and run these tests. The architect will get you results in about 35 minutes or so. So these are four settings that have a large volume of testing. And as you can see here, great sensitivity to early infection. And then lastly. Okay, and now we have our Aftima test. This is our nucleic acid test. Again, identifying infection quite early. Now, why am I going through all of this with you all? I'm going through all of this with you all to start thinking about what does identifying early infection mean? It means identifying acute infection. And that is so important because when I have acute infection, I am at my most infectious. And I will contribute more to transmitting virus to those who are exposed than any other time. And this is why it is so important. When we get infected, let's say zero over here. Today I get infected. Now, after about 10 days, 11 days, my RNA is spiking so much that I will, the Aptima test will pick up HIV infection. The P24, this is the combo test, about 16 days after infection. Go ahead and click the next one. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll try not to move around so much. I'll hold it steady. Thank you. <laughs> not move around. <laughs> okay. So, um, between the window of 11 days and 22 days, look how look at my HIV RNA. Look at my viral load spiking. I'm very infectious right here. And we can identify infection during this time period. If we are running either an Aptima test, a, a nucleic acid test, or, or an RNA test, if we're running a fourth generation test, or even right at the end around the third generation test at 22 days. Now remember those other rapid test kits. Again, they are very good test kits. They are very important. And the other test technology is out there. But where do I really want to identify my infection? When I have people who are in their acute stat in the acute phase. Go ahead. And then unfortunately, at this moment, and I do believe that we will be at a time that we will get to a time that we can identify infection within the first 10 days. I mean, I never thought when I started doing this in 1987 and had to sit down with patients and say, you're going to have to get tested again in the next three months, in the next three months, in the next three months. The fact now we can say 11 days ago, 14 days ago, 16 days ago, in all your past, you were not infected with HIV. Let's talk about what that means for you now. So, why is this again so important? Well, 49% of people who have acute HIV infection, they do develop symptoms and they do go to healthcare settings. But they are not tested for HIV. And that's again why Isabel was laying the framework for why routine HIV testing has been encouraged by the CDC since 2006. This has been since 2006 and we still do not have it established as a standard of care, and we want to support medical settings to establish. Go ahead. So again, let's go back to what happens when I'm acutely infected. This is the risk of transmission and how, how, what happens and the importance of identifying infection. 
And then if you go to the next slide, and if I don't identify infection, what happens next? Well, I continue to have behaviors such as unprotected sex, where I can acquire sexually transmitted infections, and when that happens, my viral load spikes. Again, the missed opportunities. Your patient is coming into you, has pelvic inflammatory disease. Okay, yeah, we're going to give you a big old shot of Rocephin. We're going to treat your infection. But are you testing for HIV? Go ahead. So what does the algorithm say? I'm getting to it. Well, this is the schematic of the um, recommendation for the algorithm. And as you see, it's now recommended to do fourth generation testing as a screen. And thinking, oh my goodness, you know, Jenny, this test is very expensive. What are you thinking? How do you know, how are we going to afford this? Actually, the test manufacturers, and if you are, you know, you can negotiate this. You can negotiate this with the test manufacturers. You can talk to them about, I'm going to do bulk testing now. People are doing the fourth generation testing as much as it costs them to do the third generation testing. Let's say you work with an outside reference lab, talking with them about your new contract and negotiating with them. I'm going to start adding this to my panel for my annual visits for my patients. I'm going to get one test per lifetime. I'm in my emergency center or my urgent care center. We're going to you know, look at our instrumentation and see whether or not we want to lease a new instrument. You, know, you have choices here. You have choices, and we want to encourage you to start exploring your choices. So with your fourth generation, if it is negative, hey, again, that's that great situation. Now remember, the fourth gen is 16 days after infection. So again, you can pretty much tell your patient, about two weeks ago, 16 days ago, in all your history, you were not infected with HIV. But let's talk about how that will impact your life and whether or not something has happened since then. Now, if it is reactive, we need to differentiate whether or not we're looking at HIV 1 or 2. And we run the multi-spot. And it is FDA approved to be your confirmation test. You run the multi-spot, and here we have it will show you whether or not we're looking at HIV-1 or 2 antibodies. The first one is HIV-1. You found HIV-1 antibodies. Your patient has HIV-1. You run the multi-spot, HIV-2 shows up. You've got a patient with HIV-2. And in this country, HIV-2 is still very rare. Now, there is also a possibility you've got HIV-1 and 2. And again, you need to run additional testing, and there's an entire algorithm. The CDC and APHL just did a wonderful webinar about this um, a week or two ago, and it talked about how to tighter out the testing to determine what you have. Now, the quandary of those you know, frustrating, non-reactive Western blots or the indeterminate Western blots, have you, has anybody in here ever seen those before? among your patient practice? Okay. Remember you'd say, come back and get tested in three months? Okay. We're not going to have to do that anymore. Because we, since all of this is blood, your serum, can, your testing schedule can reflex to a nucleic acid test, and you'll be able to see whether or not you've got an, an acute infection. So if you've got HIV-1 negative or indeterminate on your differentiation assay, the reflex is to do the RNA test or a nucleic acid test. If it is H RNA positive, you've got acute HIV infection. If it's RNA negative, you don't have HIV infection. Okay, next. Now, how do you interpret this? This is going to cause some changes and some l great deal of education on how to interpret this. Not only what you're looking at when you're looking at the lab paperwork, but also how you talk to the client about this. And this is some guidance. And uh, many of these slides, we have been working together, nas uh, working nationally with other jurisdictions, such as Massachusetts, uh, California, New York. And we are all working together to help interpret you know, what these tests, um, how to talk to your staff about this, how to educate staff, but also how to ed educate your patients about this. So this is some guidance right now that is in draft form. The state health department, our lab at the Department of State Health Services, is running fourth generation tests. They are using um, 
the BioRad instrument, and we are still running um, a Western blight for confirmation um, because we, they, we are doing our validation study right now with the multi-spot. So by September 1 of this year, we will be running the full algorithm. And if there is a non-reactive or indeterminate on the Western blot, we are sending our samples to Dallas for NAT testing. Okay, next one. So this is what the um, antibody, the antibody um, differentiation assay looks like. Go on. Now, again, back to why this is important, because, again, we saw between 2011 and 2012 a validation study was run, and we saw the significant number of acute infections that were missed in New York, San Francisco, and North Carolina. And you see here, of the 27 Western blots that were um, run, Seven of them were positive. Well, great, we've, we found some established infections there. But look at the number of indeterminates and negatives. And again, with the immunofluorescent assay test. Okay, go ahead. So, like I said earlier, um, the great thing about the NAT test is that it will resolve discordant results. And if you are sending your samples to our state health department, um, we will send them to, them to Dallas for NAT testing. And um, Houston, Health Department, they are running their own NAT testing as well. Go ahead. So, like I said, HIV-2 is rare, but it is a concern because we do have a larger immigrant population, especially in Houston and Dallas, and we want to resolve whether or not we've got HIV-2 infection because it does impact the treatment of the disease for that individual. Go ahead. Now, well, many of you, some of our partners, um, throughout the state have been sending their specimens to Dallas when they get a non-reactive or indeterminate Western blot. And Dallas has been great about sharing their data. So what you see here is in 2011, this is the number of uh, NAT tests that were submitted. And then you see AHI as acute HIV infection. So in 2011, 49 specimens were submitted, and these are all from hospitals, emergency centers. Acute HIV infection is walking through emergency centers' doors. Unfortunately, they're not being missed, because for these programs, for these hospitals, when they have that indeterminate or non-reactive, they're shipping it off to Dallas, and the Dallas is testing it and letting them know whether or not we've got um, a new infection. This is fairly significant, don't you think? Would you expect to have seen this? No? Yeah? Yeah? So this is the other thing that we're trying to help providers understand is the missed opportunities. And this is a way for us to assist you in providing, a, providing more support to your community and helping build a healthier community. So what do we do? Again, we're building partnerships. We're, co we're coming together. We're working together. Because in the past, like Isabel said, for those of us in, who've been in the HIV field for ages now, we used to say, oh, this is ours. We're the HIV you know, testing sites, STD testing sites. You know, we do it all. We refer you to the infection disease doc. It is a chronic condition now. But we recognize we need to pull together and work together as a team because public and private partnerships are crucial so that we identify those who have not been identified. Go ahead. What we see in Texas now is we've got almost 70,000 persons living with HIV in our state. And we normally identify about 42 to 4,500 new HIV infections each year. Now, look at the, the, so the red line is l persons living with HIV. Look how it's climbing. This is great success. This is a success of um, the treatment that has occurred. And then the 4,000, you know, it's staying steady. It's not dropping. And again, this is a success of prevention. And the deaths have been staying steady and or declining because people are not dying due to AIDS-related conditions as much as they used to. And then what has happened in the last few years, we have been working nationally with partners and it is establishing how we can have the continuum of care and the stages of engagement. So first we have to identify infections. And then we've got to uh, successfully link people into care. 
and we help them, need to help them stay in care, get them onto antiretroviral therapy, and then assist them in maintaining an undetectable viral load. Back to the idea of the more virus I have in my community, the more likelihood if I get exposed to HIV, I can become infected. Now, if I reduce the viral load, but I still have lots of people who are HIV infected in my community, there's less risk of acquisition. Okay. So, our Texas treatment continuum, when we look at the cascade, what we call the Gardner cascade, we believe that of the 100% of people who know their HIV status, only about, there are about 20 to 8, 18 to 20% who do not know their status. Okay, so those folks, like Isabel said earlier, are contributing to about between 57 and 70% of all new infections. So in the state of Texas, let's look to see what this looks like. We estimate there's 80, over 84,000 people living with HIV in the state of Texas. But we know, we know 69,000 of them have HIV. We've identified them. Good for us. In the state of Texas, for each year, and this is for a year, in 2011, 64% were linked to care in three months. That's a great success, okay? Now, it's not ideal, but it is a success. 60% had a met need, meaning they were able to um, make it to their medical care provider, they were able to make it to their appointment, they had lab drawn. They had a met need. Now. This next slot, this next column, retained in care between 2007 and 2011. 29% were in and out of care, but they did get care, and then 34% were stayed in care. And for our state, 39% have a viral load that is suppressed to where it's undetectable. This is the treatment continuum, and this is where the partnership between public and private falls in. I'm going to have to go quickly. So of the people that were linked to care, how long does it usually take? Well, we see that in 78% um, were linked to care in three months. That is very good. But there are people who do get linked to care long, that does take longer than three months, greater than four months. And then unfortunately, we do have the proportion, the 70% who were not linked into care. And that's again, where the public and private work together because we have public health follow-up to help this with this one. So the proportion of people linked to retained in care, when we look at public versus private, again, we have a Ryan White care system throughout our state. And it, their job is to assist people who've been identified and stay in care. The, the yellow bar here is all persons living with HIV. And when we look through the people that are not Ryan White clinics, or excuse me, all people, and then we just look at the Ryan White clinic patients, we see the great success of our patients who are engaged in Ryan White care services. Does this make sense? So, where do we go from now? You know, where do we go now? Where do we go from here? We recognize that we have excellent test technology available to us. How can we use it? How can we adjust our practices in using it? Because we have come so far. Over 650,000 persons um, have died due to HIV or AIDS-related conditions. Over 1.1 million people are living with HIV right now. We've got almost 70,000 in our state alone. We are in a situation right now that we can come together and start moving forward and using what is in front of us. And again, we want to support you all. We want to support your communities. We want to support you as providers to work together. And so, you know, the stigma has decreased greatly. Most of your patients think they've been tested all along whenever they drew all, well, you drew all that blood from them. So keep that in mind, and we are here as a resource for you. We have a great deal of commitment from our commissioner and our deputy commissioner when it comes to this project and assisting. It's not just a project. It's assisting in changing the standard of care. And thank you very much.
sorry, I, I, I was too far in the back, so I apologize for that. Um, our next speaker is our very dear friend, Dr. Anil Mangla, Chief, Chief Epidemiologist for San Antonio Metro Health Department. And Dr. Mangla, thank you so much for being here today and providing us some more information on the health status of our local community. Okay, we're ready to go. Um, my name is Dr. Mangla. I'm the chief epidemiologist here for San Antonio. Prior to this, I was the uh, director for infectious disease and immunizations uh, for the state of Georgia and also the acting state epidemiologist. And prior to that, I actually uh, spent some time with the United Nations Association and worked with the International uh, Infectious Disease Task Force. And so um, Judge Wolf brought up a few things about history and the past in HIV. And uh, Jenny also brought up, you know, 30 years ago how HIV worked and where it was. So what I want to show you initially is a little history and, and, and what we saw in Africa in, in maybe a decade ago and how things have changed there and then come back home and kind of look at our data locally and, and, and see how things have changed and uh, what are our barriers, and where can we go from here? So prior to uh, going any further, I do want to thank a few people. I want to thank Elizabeth for inviting me. It's an honor to be here and to share this with our community. Uh, all my STD HIV staff at uh, Metro Health uh, for actually providing this data and doing this analysis so we can actually share this with the community members. And of course, someone who's done a phenomenal job in uh, presenting data, data analysis, and looking at some of these graphs is uh, John Belenga and Kara Hessler, uh, and thanks to them. And of course, DHS, DSHS, uh, with some of the slides we actually have utilized from uh, their section. So just a quick history and origin of HIV. The origins go to as far back as the 1930s. And the first case kind of was isolated in 1958. Uh, in, in 1982, it was actually known as the gay-related immunodeficiency disease. And then a French uh, scientist physician identified this in 1983 as AIDS. From there, we started getting the serological test in 1985. And of course, the most famous uh, AZT trial started in 19... Uh, 86, and then from 87, we actually had some type of treatment for these patients. Now, while uh, my days in Africa, Whitefield and all actually developed a, 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 um, a web of causation, and you can see how complicated this is. But, but the key things they actually look at already 15 years ago is testing and counseling. And the other thing that was key that they had already identified is uh, treating STDs, identifying STDs before actually they get to HIV transmission. So you can see this goes back years and years, and this is something we are trying to identify and still fight today. So we need to kind of look at history and see what was identified while we get to move forward. This is also then by Whitefield how they identified how the progression of AIDS was, especially during the African days. So if you look at this, in a social environment uh, where one person has a new sexual partner without taking any precautions, after six years, you're going to have, of course, six bad partners. Uh, and when you enter, when someone new enters this environment, the individual would be exposed to the sexual history of almost 15,000 individuals. So you can see from this statistical 
uh, uh, model how HIV propagated in these countries, especially in the African countries, where there was actually no precaution or no condom use or the more important thing, no treatment. So again, uh, while uh, being with the United Nations, I spent some of my time at the epicenter of where HIV was. And you can see how the disease progressed. And the sub-Saharan Africa was really very, very uh, affected with some of the uh, prevalence rates going up to 50% and, and in countries like Botswana. Uh, Swaziland had that high number of uh, individuals that actually were infected. Um, this, this is an interesting graph, and you can see the, the amount of uh, projected deaths in South Africa as the years went by. So this is, would be a normal uh, trend for death, and because of HIV, you could see that number. But this was not just projected, because when I was there in 2004, these were things that were coming in the newspapers. Graves to be recycled because there was no place for people for burials. Um, you can see how the governments in those countries were fighting HIV and thought it's just an hypothesis. Um, you can see ministers there actually fought and resisted against therapy. And this was, if you look at the date on the 12th, they were still fighting if they want to kind of ban the drug or not. And then 13 next, they, they asked and they banned nevorapine. Now we know today nevorapine is a key medication for the transmission from mother to child. And we have successfully eliminated newborn HIV cases to more than 95 and higher percent. But again, you can see 10, 15 years ago, this was not the case because the governments were still fighting these drugs. The only thing they could do, and this was a sign that I had um, kind of took a picture while I was in Swaziland, and you can see what they were promoting at that time, and you can see USAID, um, is the use of condom. So again, the prevention was key, but prevention was the only method they had. They had no treatment because if you remember at this time, there was a big thing about patents. And due to patents, there was no generics at that time, especially in these developing countries. So treatment was minimum. And so the only other alternative for prevention was condom use. And you can see the famous HIV sign and what they really kind of had in the newspaper of AIDS reality. So, I bring this up to show how scary it was at that time, and, and, and AIDS was a scare. When you heard of HIV, it was almost a death sentence. So there's some sensitive slides, and then I'll go to kind of our data. But you can, we had, while we were there, we had kids draw pictures of what they think their village is all about. And, and, and look at these pictures. A 13-year-old girl living alone, and the, and, and, and the key thing they have here is these coffins. And this was a norm. You could see this in any village that you went in the sub-Saharan Africa regions. Um, here's another one. And you can see, you get the picture of, of or, or a trend even, of what kids were actually looking at. Dark colors, coffins, death. Here's another one. Uh, a lone girl. So this, these things gave you a picture that this was a major, major concern. Then we come to the next step. So there was a lot of research done in, with the pharmaceuticals in seeing what can we identify. So there was a variety of drugs that were identified, starting from protease inhibitors, integrase in inhibitors, entry inhibitors. And what they did is they looked at the life cycle of the HIV drug. And at every point where there was replication, there was entry, they tried to find an inhibitor. From there, we have had tremendous success. If you look at, uh, if you look at the slide from 85 to right now to 2013, there's numerous medications that have come up. So treatment is now possible. And so with all this, there's been numerous generic medications. And with the generic medications, there's been a large access of this in many of the African countries. And this was very interesting because, again, as Jenny had brought up, 
and, and, and Judge Hulf has brought up, the key here is testing. You need to identify individuals that have HIV. So the World Health Organization actually uh, had a, uh, oh, sorry. So, so the World Health Organization actually had a press release that clearly showed that um, antiretroviral therapy to be 96% effective in reducing HIV transmission. So if you provided access to care, linkage to care, provided the medication, antiretrovirals, viral load goes down, trans transmission decreases. Many of these African countries for after 2001, 2004, started providing almost 75% of their population with these antiretrovirals. Guess what happened? If you look at some of these statistics, there's been a exponential decrease in the amount of HIV in these countries. I'll just kind of give you uh, uh, proper percentages. The country Malawi decreased the HIV incidence by 73%. Botswana that had almost a 50% prevalence rate decreased the amount by 68%. Namibia, 58%. Zambia, 56%. Zimbabwe and South Africa, around 40 to 41%. Look where we are in the United States, right? We're still stable. We haven't done much change in all these years. Now let's come to San Antonio. We're not just stable, our numbers have increased. So, so where do we stand? What are we doing? Um, so let's look at where we are in San Antonio. So I'm going to give you a big picture first of Texas, and you can see the Texas rate in 2001 was 13.5 per 100,000 population. When we come to Bear County, just in the state of Texas, or the state of Texas is 17.2. Bear County, we at 20.6. Uh, per 100,000 population. Um, living with HIV, again, our numbers are not the highest in Texas, but again, we're third highest when it comes to cities. So you can see kind of a distribution of people living with HIV. But here's our local statistics, and you can see there's been a 2% increase from uh, 2001 to 2002. But if you look at, when we look at this uh, uh, five-year trends, a uh, moving trend, we have from 2000 to 2012, we have a 47% increase in our cases in HIV. So again, if you looked at some of these African countries, they've gone down. We've gone up in the past decade. So let's break it up and then and, and look at kind of just rates. If you look at rates, we are actually 1.2 times higher than, than the state of Texas, and we're 1.6 times higher than the national average. So again, we're not doing very good both compared to the state as well as nationally. When we break this down further into who is affected, where is this coming from? And so when you look at that, you can very clearly see the males are much more, almost seven times, uh, uh, twice as, um, well, if you look at females and males, it's, it's um, five times more uh, at risk than the females. So we have, in our population here, the males are much more at higher risk. Um, what about ethnicity? Again, ethnicity, uh, the black population has a rate of 50.5 per 100,000 population compared to uh, the Hispanics and uh, the white population. We broke it, break it down by age, and as you can see, age groups, the key age group here is 20 to 24. The age group of 25 to 29 is going up. But what is also concerning is this line here. See, this is the population 15 to 19. And if, if you notice, we actually have in, and, and, and I bring this up because when you look at uh, syphilis, we have sometimes in our clinic at uh, Metro Health people under the age of, 21 coming into the office with STDs. So you can see that this is a population that's on the rise. Um, which transmission category are we looking at here in San Antonio that's key to us? And if you look at it, most of the cases we have here 
is uh, MSM, men having sex with men. So after identifying this type of information, our STD uh, clinic and, and our DIS uh, staff are actually really focusing our efforts in these areas. And we're also looking at many of the bathhouses that are here because that looks like a key area that is to be targeted. And uh, that would be more discussed in detail uh, in one of the breakout groups uh, when my uh, uh, Metro Health STD section is actually going to be presenting that. Um, again, transmission category, if you look at different cities, uh, comparative to San Antonio, uh, we in San Antonio here also pretty much majority is MSM, but you can see many of the other major cities also is actually uh, indicative of uh, a transmission which is due to MSM. Uh, we also have a little of the uh, heterosexual uh, IDU use um, in both the MSM and IDU use. The other important thing here that as physicians you've got to look out for is uh, the issue of comorbidity. And when you look at comorbidity, you can see uh, almost 15% of this population are, uh, are infected with other STDs and then TB. And if you look at, if you remember when we talk of comorbidities, uh, in, the, in the late 90s, the TB rate in, in, in the sub saharan region was actually going down. And when we looked at HIV AIDS coming back um, uh, as um, one of the um, major uh, diseases in those areas, we had a spike in the TB cases there, and so this was really a, a, a clear indication of, you know, where more comorbidity is and, 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 and it affects uh, many of this population. So kind of putting that aside, you can see our HIV rates have uh, gone up in this city. And, and, and uh, not to forget now STDs, so I'll, I'll, I'll really go real fast in the STDs because uh, I want to make sure that we have time for some questions. And if you look at the STD rates, you can see the STD rates in the US is about 4.5 per 100,000 population. Uh, but you can see where we stand in Bear County. Compare, and, and Texas is much low, just very similar to uh, the national average. This is giving you a kind of just an idea of when you look at counties, and this was uh, 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 on, uh, on the CDC website and uh, countywide, if you look at some of our counties here, very high when it comes to STD. Uh, this is giving you primary and secondary syphilis. Again, our, our numbers here in Bear County, both 2011, 2012, uh, pretty high. We gone much higher within just that one year. Um, okay. So this is this is so, so this is kind of the key. If you look at the U.S. rate and the Texas rate, very similar, but we lead the state in Bear County when it comes to STDs, with our rate being 10.5 per 100,000 population. Um, this is broken up into the type of STDs, and you can see that we have uh, an increase in, in uh, actually, um, most of the STDs, uh, but when you look at um, syphilis, our numbers are going much, much, much higher. Uh, this is an idea of where we are with syphilis, and I'm looking at all stages. And it, with syphilis, uh, we are two times two uh, times higher than the state of Texas and 3.6 times higher than the U.S. rate. U.S. rate, Texas, you can see where we are. And just over the past year, we have actually even shot up. This gives you an idea of our numbers. So we have gradually increased over the past years, and there has been no decrease in the STD rates. But just over the past year, 11 to 12, we have gone up much, much higher with STD. Now, there's a few things that may be also important here, is uh, we initiated in the health department a much more vigorous STD program. And when you look at an STD program, what we had is we increased the capacity of DIS. And the DIS uh, folks, which is disease intervention specialists, have done a phenomenal job. And, 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 and in that sense, what they've done is increase the amount of tracking. 
and in, in, in uh, partner context. So this increase may be twofold. There is a real increase in uh, Bear County, no doubt. But we also identify many more syphilis cases. And in that is also kind of showing right there. So that may also look at, you know, are there more numbers that are going up, more people getting infected, and are we identifying more people or many people were not tested? So those are kind of key uh, factors that we need to kind of, or facts we need to look as we see that graph. Um, this also is now looking at um, the uh, primary and secondary cases of syphilis rates 2000, 2012, and you can see our rates are much, much high. Uh, when you break it up into uh, gender, uh, again, males are much, much, much higher with 30.5 per 100,000 population compared uh, to females, which is just 6.3. So again, about almost five, six times higher. Uh, ethnicity, uh, the African-American population, again, much, much higher. Comes the Hispanic and then the... Uh, the um, uh, white and other are almost uh, the same when it comes to uh, rates. Women and men. So you can see when it comes to ages, a lot of the ages are all already increasing with, when you look at the age group 30 to 34 being pretty high, uh, one of the highest, and then comes uh, the uh, age uh, 35 to 39. Uh, in men, a little different. Um, highest again year is the 25 to 29, where um, there's a decrease. But as you can see, there's a decrease in syphilis year when it comes to uh, ages 15 to 19. The other issue we have in here, as you know, if, the con if, if syphilis rates are increasing, especially our primary and secondary, let's look at what happens with congenital syphilis. Congenital syphilis, if we're looking at the U.S. average, 8.5, uh, you're looking at Bear County, 31.4 per 100,000 population. Um, syphilis rates has just um, shot up in the past one year where we actually, if you look at um, the rates here, our rates uh, are almost nine times higher than the U.S. average in congenital syphilis. Last year, we had almost the highest uh, amount of congenital syphilis cases at 18 cases uh, during the year 2012. So that's, um, that's uh, really a concern. Uh, if you look at uh, the uh, syphilis cases in infants, as I was saying, 18. Uh, and then you look at primary and secondary cases in women, 56. So again, what we are doing at uh, the uh, Metro Health Clinic is we are now trying to monitor any pregnant women that come in and trying to follow, try to get follow-ups uh, within every, almost every month till they uh, give birth so we can make sure that if they do get infected during their pregnancy, uh, they get treated because as we know, congenital syphilis is 100% uh, preventable if we can get treatment in time. This is just a, a, a kind of broad picture of some of the statistics that we have in, and you can see here that um, uh, the age of mother, age under 20, uh, with our cases for 2012, 29% were under 20, 24% uh, were between 20 and 25, and greater than 25 were uh, Forty-seven percent. The average age of uh, a congenital case women was uh, twenty-five years old. This is a very important uh, kind of uh, analysis that was performed, which clearly kind of shows you uh, the twenty-nine percent had absolutely no prenatal care, right? But what is disturbing to me is this number, where you look at uh, twenty-nine percent had more than ten prenatal care visits. If you're looking at more than 10 prenatal care visits, normally the individual is going to get a screening when they get their first prenatal care. They're going to get screened when they give birth. So you have two screenings, but there was never that in-between screen. 
And that was key in identifying, and if we could have do the screen or perform the screens, we could identify these mothers and prevent these cases. So these are very important analysis where we can actually put forward some type of policies and some type of um, uh, methods where we can actually you know, decrease these numbers. Other info important information we identified was uh, mothers of congenital syphilis cases also had other risk factors and behaviors which were drug use, incarceration, and of course, uh, sex workers. So the recommendi recommendation here, and um, our health director has sent a letter out to uh, all hospitals and all providers uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, screening. And, and, and what we're doing is we have identified that they need to add a early third trimester screening for syphilis uh, for all high-risk women. And, and when you're looking at high-risk, Bear County is considered high-risk, and as a matter of fact, the state of Texas is high-risk, so we are encouraging physicians locally to perform these uh, screens uh, during early third trimester in these women, because most of these women have been infected, as you can see, during their pregnancy. Um, other things that our section is doing here in, uh, at Metro Health, and I'm not gonna go into detail with this, but uh, this will be presented later by our DIS uh, section, is you can see in, 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 in trying to prevent syphilis, there's a variety of new uh, programs that have been initiated both within the clinic as well as uh, in the community. Uh, we have also uh, increased our outreach uh, regarding uh, congenital syphilis. And again, this will be more discussed later today. And of course, with HIV, there's been a variety of initiatives that have been taken to make sure that we are making providers aware, we're having CBOs aware, and of course, just the community. So there's, there's many press releases that have been uh, uh, conducted, and we are also uh, uh, gonna be doing many, many more during this year just to make awareness and, and to show the community that this is an important issue and how do we face it. So on that note, I'll kind of stop and I'll take any questions and, and, and um, you know, I hope this has been helpful. And if anybody needs this type of information, please contact us and we will be glad to share that with you. Thank you. Yes. The HIV-1, uh, it's a different, it's a type of strain. So what you have is, uh, when you look at worldwide, we have more HIV locally as HIV-1. HIV-2, you normally see a larger percent of that from Africa. Now there is what happens is some of the individuals, and it was a few years ago, where individuals were actually uh, infected with both HIV-1, HIV-2, and that was actually called a superbug. Uh, very concerning because it, it's uh, very resistant to some of these antiretrovirals. There's the
right. So, so that's a very good question. When you, uh, a few years ago, there was a um, article in the MMWR where um, CDC looked at it was the city of Philadelphia where they had an increase, a spike in the number of syphilis cases, and it was attributed very clearly to the uh, sex workers. Here, there is when we're looking at uh, syphilis, here we're looking at a variety of risk factors. Now, we don't say sex workers is the key, but that is one of the risk factors. We also look in, when we looked at incarceration, uh, we started doing a variety of uh, testing, and I think uh, we do uh, syphilis testing there. And a large number of uh, cases are from folks that are in the jails. As a matter of fact, in, the, in 2012, was it three, three or four of our cases were actually from the jail? Uh, so, you know, that's again a, a area we should actually uh, keep in mind that it's a key, um, you know, um, contributor to the cases that we are getting here in uh, Bear County. So uh, we have our DIS individuals here which are going to talk about that. So we actually are looking very closely to social networking and they're actually looking at a variety of these websites and trying to link this because when, when our patients are coming into the clinic, we're actually um, asking them questionnaires and, 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 and then, um, I, I mean, the DIS would talk about that later, but yes, we are looking at social networking as well. Right. But that's, I think that's the same thing we have seen when I spent some time in the clinic um, last year. We had actually individuals come in, um, you know, they were given education, they were given condoms, make sure, you know, you look at prevention. And, and guess what? Three, four months go by and they're back in the clinic with the same thing. So yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that's not just, you know, in one clinic. I, I bet we, we must be seeing that all around. Yeah. <coughs> Right. 
Right. Right. They also have, uh, they don't have, uh, they don't call them dead. Um, so that's, that's what's been documented. When we looked at data, and I, and, and I don't have that slide here, but I think if you looked at our cases for congenital syphilis for 2012, greater than 50% of the women were married. And so, again, it's that bisexuality, you know, it's, it's, it's the other man going out, coming back home, um, and having intercourse with the woman who doesn't know that. So that, that. That is something, you know, we are looking at our analysis and seeing if that is also that one risk factor. Just to um, share a little bit statewide information, I'm sure the DIS can corroborate this as well. Remember, syphilis and HIV is transmitted, you know, between men and women as well. And because of, and interestingly, in San Antonio, especially with syphilis, we do see a, a significant amount of uh, heterosexually transmitted, male to female transmitted, female to male transmitted syphilis, which is quite interesting. Right. Because we have seen larger right. rates of MSM transmission syphilis around the state. Um, and remember also, when it comes to HIV, the statistics that we stated earlier, which was, you know, among the population that do not know their status of HIV infection, they contribute to, and it is yeah. estimated, up to 72% of all new infections. And when I have acute infection, and if I have right. a morbidity, then right. I'm much more infectious, right. or I'm likely right. to acquire disease right. as well. So, yep. you know, the Screening right. is important, Order. but also acknowledging that having interventions for our persons living with HIV that are effective, and also the fact that public health follow-up now is becoming more and more educated and uh, knowledgeable about applications such as Grindr. You know, uh, an application where you can hook up with someone and you can see <laughs> even in your proximity who else is interested in hooking up. And it is cultural as well. but. You know, putting a finger on an exact determinant, there are multiple yeah, determinants, right. but I, it is important to acknowledge yeah. what does culture have to do with this as well. Well, thank you again.